let's move on. The next chapter is about event supply management, I think. That's chapter 5. Let's see in the textbook here. I haven't made any foils on this one, so we'll do it straightforwardly, okay? Event supply chains. Now, in, uh, we did not discuss supply chain management. It's, uh, it's a kind of standard term in logistics. We abbreviate it like this, SCM. So SCM means supply chain management. In many ways, it's a kind of a sub-discipline in logistics. Some would say the other way around. I, I normally define it like this. It's a kind of a special area of logistics problems, which uh, many researchers work on. Um, and it's related to these first two words, supply chains. You know what a chain is? It's kind of a something that is linked together. And it has kind of been uh, more and more relevant uh, as a function of globalization. I could say. So in a globalized world, uh, you tend to get high degrees of specialization. So those who are very good at making car tires makes the tires, those who are very good at making the engines makes the engines, those who are very good at and so on. So as opposed to the old days when Henry Ford produced his assembly lines, uh, you find a lot of different parts, components uh, in a Ford car today. No? If you, for instance, look at the two main competitors in the computer markets today, uh, Samsung and Apple, uh, many parts in Apple computers are produced by Samsung. Perhaps not so much the other way around, but uh, if you look at the standard MacBook, uh, the screen is typically made either by LG or Samsung. The graphic card is made by somebody else. So, in the old days, when you had a kind of a single producer producing everything of a product has changed a lot now. So today, uh, most modern products have a whole myriad of different producers inside them. And uh, it's more complex than this because if you look at a given graphic card in a computer, there could be other producers per seeing this final producer as well. So there's components and subparts there which are not produced by, what do they call this? What does, do you know any names of graphic cards producers? There's some, something called NVIDIA, is it? Something called AMD. Yeah, these are typically American firms. But uh, they are only kind of uh, putting things together. So there are other producers again, producing input and others in front of that again. So we could get, a, in fact, today very long chains. Okay. And supply chain management is about how to handle modern product chains. Uh, if you think about the situation between Samsung and Apple, you know that they, are, they compete, they compete, okay? Especially they compete on the cell phone market. I have a... I don't have it here. I have a Samsung phone. I assume some of you have an iPhone? Yeah. Yeah. You have an iPhone, Mario. What about you, Olivia? You too? Uh, Erika? So you have another one. Which brand do you have? HTC. HTC, okay. And you, do you have a cell phone? I uh, have an old HTC. Yes. Okay. So this, this obviously must create problems, doesn't it? If two strong competitors kind of collaborate on producing components for each other, then you need something to take care of this, okay? And you need to kind of handle this in one way or another. And it is typical for the supply chain management problems. There's a kind of this, this mix between cooperation and competition and how to kind of deal with this. I'm not an expert on supply chain management, I should tell you. I've not studied the topic a lot. I've taught some courses in it. Uh, in my opinion, much of the supply chain, man ch chain management literature is not very research-oriented. There's a lot of cases. You go into some business, look at their supply chain, the first thing they do then is to kind of get up the supply chain. Okay, let's write it on the wall. And then you start discussing, is this relevant, should you do it different, and so on. And wh where is the threats, where is the possibilities, and this kind of... Should we say more less stringent analysis 
uh, approach. But there is nothing in the way of kind of doing, should we say, more scientific research related to supply chain management, especially if you kind of accept my allegation that these are problems related to a surface which combines cooperation and competition. Uh, game theory, of course, deals with this. Okay, so if there is potential for both cooperation and competition, then you have a kind of toolbox that handles that, and we call that toolbox game theory. So uh, I expect that in the future, much more of the supply chain management literature we kind of discuss and relate to game theory. So what about events? Do we have any supply chains in, the, in events? Yes. Uh, we do, don't we? If you think about football, there is a lot of agents involved. The other day I got an email from a football agent from Nigeria. Have you been to Nigeria, Joe? No. no. It's far from Zambia. Yes. Yeah. But it's the biggest country in Africa, isn't it? Population-wise, I think so, yeah. And it turns out that uh, I'm a friend with this uh, Daniel Shimashuku, you know, the, the Molde player on Facebook, and he had seen my name, so he sent me an email and asked if, if I could help him selling football players in Molde, and I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's not my business. But uh, we have some agents around, okay, and there is agents and agents and agents, there are agents from the clubs, and, and there are agents outside the clubs, and there are uh, other types of agents, so th there's a lot, there's a kind of, uh, a very complex supply chain when it comes to kind of what we what we refer to as player logistics kind of how, how does football players move around and the idea is of course as always to kind of assign the right player to the right club at the right time that's kind of a log logistics way of speaking it isn't it but the, the question arises then do we kind of have a system which kind of makes this work as it should or could we do something should we put in some other agents remove some agents most of the coaches say if we didn't had if we, if, if, we get, if we got rid of the agents, then everything would be nice. Of course, this is a, a great uh, oversimplification because these agents then come up based on the need here. Okay, and the need is to kind of remove the asymmetric information between selling clubs and buying clubs. Okay, if I want to buy a football player and I I look at the market and uh, I get talk to a club in, say, Ar Ar Argentina and they say, oh, I have this very good striker, you can get him cheap, okay? Should I buy him? Perhaps not, okay? <laughs> but an agent could probably tell me, okay, maybe you can look at that one instead, instead of that one. So that, that could be helpful. So, uh, as time moves on, you would expect even more complex uh, supply chains. And you probably know that in the, in the music business, these supply chains have increased so all artists, they have a management, they have a, a booking manager, and there's all kind of stuff. And you never kind of get to talk to the artist as, a, as an event producer. You kind of have to talk to some various levels of management. Mm. And to be able to handle these problems, you need to handle these problems to be able to stage any kind of event. Okay? You need to get your artist to come to play for you. And to, to be able to do that, you need to know how to handle these, these things. Today, uh, we see a kind of development where, uh, let's say, U.S. artists, they kind of make a tour, okay, so they, they predefine a set of countries which they will visit in Europe uh, when they plan their tour. So if Justin Bieber wants to come to Europe, okay, say, I will play in Paris and London and Oslo and Stockholm and so on, okay, and, uh, and then they define this. Uh, but if you're not that location, then uh, could you then kind of change this? to kind of make a small uh, leap off the route into your sound to, to continue. And it's these kind of things that, that is the main problem with kind of getting artists uh, that, that you like. So if you return to the football world, there is each player has his own agent or maybe more than one agent. Each, each club is related to certain agents. They have their own scouts and so on. And, and all this complexity is even more building up as, as long as uh, money is increasing here, of course. Uh, if you can get a small percentage of a, a transfer fee of a, a billion Norwegian crowns, then that could amount to a, a fair amount of money. So, uh, so uh, there, is, uh, there is a market for this kind of stuff. There is, however, a major difference 
difference between, should we say, manufacturing supply chains and event supply chains. In manufacturing supply chain, it is actually the fact that various parts of the product is produced by different producers. But the event production itself is normally not affected, at least not yet. Okay? So uh, if, you, if you book Rolling Stones, Rolling Stones come and play. Okay? But there could be su a substitute on the base, perhaps, in that case, that would affect the price. So, so there is a possibility here to, to kind of have subcontractors kind of producing parts of your event. And when it comes to the kind of input side of events, when it comes to ordering catering and so on, you can, of course, buy from a caterer who has, has a kind of supply chain behind him or her. Okay? So, so there is still relevance in the event uh, situation. But again, we see kind of different supply chains. They are different. They are not equal, uh, not of the same type normally, as they are in classical manufacturing. Okay. Uh, one thing is which is perhaps slightly interesting is that if you look at service production, which we kind of have defined previously as a and we, we discussed this, whether events were in service or in manufacturing, and we kind of said it's somewhere in between, but perhaps closer to, to service production. Um, we don't see so much of complex supply chains in service production. Think about lawyers or policemen or teachers or, and so on, okay? Uh, if you look at schools, the, the supply chains are kind of as they always have been, more or less. Of course, we can put things on video, but that doesn't really change the supply chain as such. But in a future situation where, where instead of students kind of going at a single university, they just shop freely on the internet for courses to build an education, then that would change stuff. Okay? Then you would kind of be more in a, a complex supply chain management environment than you are today. So I would expect that in the future uh, uh, you will all sit uh, down by a computer receiving teaching, not, not actually enrolling at the university. You can do it at home. Of course, this is, this is good in some ways, bad in other ways. It's, uh, there is some learning, at least some social learning, in gathering together at a, a, a place you don't know so much. And that uh, have, of course, a value by itself. So uh, I don't think you will kind of see it completely in, in, in those ways, but uh, to some extent, perhaps. Okay, what did I miss? Yeah, I see my, I talked about the most here, I think. Of course, if you think about music festivals, there, there's obvious competition in between them. Okay? If you think about the Molde Jazz Festival, there is another one in Norway, in Kongsberg. And there's obvious competition here, and kind of uh, trying to get uh, artists which the other festival don't have. And of course, you could also see cooperation op options here. If they kind of go together, they could perhaps be able to get an artist in. Because there's uh, two or more gigs instead of a single one. That could kind of raise more money, that could uh, make it possible to, to happen. So again, we kind of see these competitive versus cooperative possibilities, which kind of is the, the, the main uh, part in supply chain management, at least as I see it. But uh, again, let me remind you, this field as a kind of scientific field is far from evolved. There's a lot to come here, I think, research-wise, especially on the more formal way of doing it, typically using game theory, I would expect. And uh, so far we have seen relatively little of that. But in the next 10, 20, 30 years, there will probably be a, a big field here on understanding these topics better. Okay, I think that was uh, what I thought uh, I should say about chapter 5. Then some word about chapter 6, event transportation. Now we have we have briefly discussed this already, haven't we? Uh, there is a main difference between manufactured products and events. Services for that manner. That instead of bringing the product to the consumer, the consumer is normally brought to the event or to the service provider. There has been some attempts in servicing to try to use electronic means, for instance, you can 
you can today you can in principle perf perform surgery in a hospital based on on a computerized link to United States, so there can be a, a top surgeon in the United States instructing local surgeons in Norway to kind of do the operation. Okay, so th that is one way of kind of distributing this uh, the other way. But, but normally, at least when it comes to events uh, today, to actually see the real event, you have to be there. Uh, so uh, we typically face the opposite problem when it comes to events as compared to normal manufactured goods. If you look at manufactured goods, of course, it's extremely important to kind of cover this gap be between the production point and the consumption point. Because if you're not able to build that bridge, then you won't sell your product. Okay? So you need that must be done. So in that sense, in classical manufacturing, transportation is extremely important. Okay? And typically, there is some kind of responsibility on the producer to, to, be to, to, to take the product from his production point and move it to the desired consumption point. So then stuff must be done. Okay? A, a producer must uh, make some decisions. Should I buy my own lorries? Should I use an existing firm? Can I use air transport? Can I use boat transport? Of course, this depends on the product. Okay? Certain products need to be transported fast, then of course you may need plane. Others are uh, not in the, the speed need. And you can use both, for instance. Uh, one of the major exporting products of Norway, uh, there are two of them, uh, apart from oil. Uh, one is called clipfish, the other is salmon. And the salmon fish is, of course, is normally preserved relatively fresh, either actual fresh or frozen. And uh, in those cases, you either use lorries or planes to transport it. Well, this clipfish is dried, so it's kind of viable. It doesn't uh, take uh, damage from being uh, transported in a certain amount of time, so then you typically use both. Of course, uh, the fact that clipfish is, is uh, exported to Portugal, Spain and uh, Brazil makes both even more sensible, while salmon is transported everywhere, so then you need to do things a little bit differently. Research-wise, in classical logistics, there is this kind of problem that has kind of been very much researched and very much looked at, and is often referred to as the VRP problem. That means vehicle routing problem. And these problems, they kind of uh, come after you made all these decisions I talked about. When you decided how to do this, what kind of transport, transport, transportation modes to use, then you need to decide on how to do this. Okay? So if you, if you have a kind of a set of trucks and you have some products that should be distributed to certain locations, then the question is on, uh, of course, how to distribute these trucks. Should they all go to the same tops? Should they be kind of distributed into areas where one truck and, and this kind of stuff? Okay? So this is, this is a classical mathematical programming problem. It involves binary variables and it turns out to be fairly difficult to solve. So in that sense, uh, it kind of uh, attracts researchers to look at it. And there's all kinds of versions of this. Whether uh, you have one track or many tracks, and different sizes of tracks, and different qualities on roads. And if there's time windows that you have to be in certain locations within a certain time, and you have to leave in within a certain time, and all this stuff. And it, it all creates a lot of mathematical problems. So there's a rich literature here on, on these matters. So if this is something that interests you, then then there is always something to look at here. The event side, as I briefly said previously, is, is kind of the opposite. So instead of uh, having the problem of bringing the product to the customer, the, the, the problem is turned around. You have to bring the customer to the product or to the event. Fortunately, there is a given infrastructure almost everywhere. So you have some trains, you have some roads, there is some cars, some trains, airplanes and so on. Okay, so, and these, there is a certain capacity here, so unless your event is mega big, then you really normally don't have to do anything. Okay? Of course, if you want to make a kind of big international event, then you may have may kind of oil something, you may, may need to make some nego negocia ne negotiations with certain transporters to get some cheap tickets and so on, but uh, 
But in most cases, most event producers take very limited responsibility for traveling. Of course, the assumption is that travel is possible outside of the control of the event organizer. And as you probably know, most transportation decisions are, are made by the government and the states. So the state cannot take responsibility that uh, a certain location is reachable. Of course, it could have been better, but uh, in most cases, it doesn't really create big problems. Uh, you remember I told you about the problems that emerged in the Ski World Championship in Oslo in 2011? Of course, th that could happen. If, you, if the demand kind of becomes too big, bigger than you expected, then you can run into problems. And of course, if, you, if the audience don't get to the event, then there is a big problem. Then you have a lot of unhappy c consumers, and there's a lot of us. Luckily for these sport events, there's a long time in between, so most people seem to forget potential problems the last time. There was uh, a ski world championship in Trondheim in 97. There was in one in Oslo, I think, in 1980. So you see that it, it, it's a kind of a 15-year period in between, and the Olympic Games in Norway is 30, 40, or 50 years in between. So. So what you did wrong on one event does not necessarily imply that customers affects the next event. But if you run a jazz festival in Moldor or everywhere else, or any kind of festival, and if, if people are not able to get to the venues, then of course there is a problem. Then people won't come back and you lose your customer, which is of course the thing you really don't want to do when you run events. But in that sense, uh, Transportation problems in events are perhaps not that vital. So this is kind of a, perhaps a big difference between, should we say, manufacturing logistics or industrial logistics compared to event logistics. The, the, the transportation part is, is not the one which you should focus most on, in my opinion. Of course, if you want to stage a big event on Svalbard, then you must do something. Okay? If you want to attract hundreds of thousands of people at a concert in Svalbard, which, which obviously could be a nice thing, if you're allowed to do it, by the way. Uh, you know where Svalbard is? Yeah. 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 I don't think Olivia and Joe does. No. Let me tell you. And we need a map, don't we? Uh, let's see here. These days there's something called Google, Google Maps, isn't it? That is nice. Here is Svalbard. You can see it here. But it's, it's hard to see where it is. Okay, so we must zoom out a little. Oh no, that was the wrong direction. You see it's up here. This is Norway. We are here now. So this is the northern part of Norway, actually. It's, uh, it's not really Norway, but it's almost Norway. Meaning that it's kind of uh, divided between Norway and Russia, actually. So we kind of, I think Norway is in charge of this, but there is uh, a Russian part of it. Uh, it's, of course, a very spectacular place. Um, there's ice bears there walking around, so you have to be careful. I have never been there. Uh, have you been there, Erika? No, I haven't. No. Would you like to go there? Perhaps. Perhaps. It's very cold. Uh, only ice bears to look. But of course it could be a nice place to stage an event, okay? <laughs> it could be the Arctic concert tour or something, okay? That would be nice. Uh, but if you were to do that, of course, then you would have to take care of transport, because then you, there is a very limited amount of planes going up there, so you cannot actually get this number of people up there. That's not possible. Of course, if you want to, to stage a kind of festival in the, in the inner parts of Sahara, then you probably also need to make some special arrangements, don't you think so? It, it, there is no kind of regular routes there, there's no railroads, almost no roads. So you would need to do something. So in those cases, but this is kind of special cases, most events are kind of located in, in areas where transportation is feasible and available. If not, you'd have to make special arrangements anyway. So uh, in that sense, I think we can conclude that Event transportation is perhaps a subject we, we really don't deal very much with in event management in general. Okay, what did I miss now?
Yeah, it says here that in most situations, event producers rely on existing public or private transportation means to fulfill the transportation demand. Yeah. Now, if, if you think about really mega events, of course, if you want to arrange Olympic Games, then, then normally there is a kind of transportation plan related to the application. And in most cases, this transportation plan includes building new infrastructure. For instance, when we arranged the last Olympics in Norway in 94 at Lillehammer, there were some roads that should be built a part of the whole project. So uh, in those cases, you do stuff. Okay? So if, you, if the IOC uh, defines a kind of new location for Olympic Games, then of course there is normally a transportation plan involved in the application itself. And then you need to, to kind of... Uh, you need to tell uh, through this plan that uh, there is a reasonable possibility that the customers who are interested in coming and watch are able to get there in time and that there is a, a, a suitable amount of overnight seats and what, what actually is necessary. Okay. I think that was... Uh, more or less what I intended to say about transportation. So the, the rough conclusion is that we don't need to bother so much about it, which is a good thing. On the other hand, if we want to have special located events, then of course we need to really bother about it, and then we need, may actually have to need to build new infrastructure to make people get there. But this is not something that a kind of ordinary event organizer do. The reason is, of course, that in most countries there is a public there is a public ownership of, of, of these roads and so on, so you, cannot, you, you can't actually do it. It has to be in cooperation, close cooperation with the government to, to be able to, to do this. And you cannot kind of set up own airplane routes, that's not allowed, okay? You need to have all kinds of certificates, it's, uh, so you, you need to cooperate with authorities to, to be able to, to sort out special transportation needs related to, to, to special events. But as I said, in most cases, this is not a big issue. So uh, here is a very clear difference between manufacturing logistics and event logistics. We don't need to bother so much, much about the transportation part. And uh, we don't either in most cases. Okay, questions? Now we have some time. We might as well take another chapter, I think. Yeah, we can. So let's spend a little time finally today on chapter 7. It's called Events and Dynamic Pricing. Okay. Oh, let me just see if I can find the textbook here. Perhaps is that good? Is this? Can you see this? Mm -hmm. uh, let's move to there. You probably know that if you are to buy an air ticket, uh, the time you buy it on is important when it comes to getting the good price. Okay, so you can you have to kind of search to to find uh, the timing for your travel to kind of minimize your own costs. Of course, this means that the air companies they kind of use different prices on different time points. That's what we mean by dynamic pricing. Okay, so you have a price which changes over time for the same type of product. Now, if we start by kind of thinking about manufacturing, the manufacturing kind of situation or the service kind of situation, 
we relatively fast find out that dynamic pricing perhaps and you should not confuse these type of dynamic pricing with sales and discounts okay that is a different type of dynamic pricing so what we think about when we think about dynamic pricing here at least in the logistics sense is prices who are related to utilizing the producer's production capacity now suppose I sell milk okay I have a shop and this is the only shop around so there's very far to the next milk shop okay and I, I have observed that uh, the demand for my milk it changes over time on a daily basis okay so if if my shop starts opens at nine o'clock in the morning then I get a peak and then it goes down I get a little more peak around noon and after uh, around 1630 I get my big peak do you th think this is would be a reasonable demand pattern yeah that's probably what you'd expect that uh, there is somebody who wants to buy some milk in the morning and of course those who come back from work they, they then you sell more milk okay so this is kind of what you would expect the demand pattern to be selling milk now in order to sell this milk you need some people to sell it don't you? you need some cashiers and of course you may have the cashiers but if you don't have people in them then, then it may be crowded so people may kind of avoid coming or it can uh, take a lot of time an alternative to having this demand profile is to try to change this through your pricing okay if I increase my price a little bit here a little bit less here and a little bit more here what would happen to the demand then increase yeah I increase it I make it more expensive now to buy milk in the morning and and around 1630 what would people do then and we assume now that there are no competitors okay that is very important if, if it had been a competitor of course people will go to them okay so now we assume an effective monopoly Demand yeah, so you would kind of uh, change your demand to maybe something more constant in a way, okay? Would that be beneficial? Would that be a good idea? From your point of view, as, as the runner of the shop? given that for people expect this, ac accept this and don't kind of stay out all the time this is what they do on airplanes isn't it they have certain demand in high demand periods they increase the price in low demand periods they decrease the price so they, they try to fill up their planes in a sense like we try to smoothen our demand here this would be cheaper wouldn't it because in in this case you'd have to have extra people here we would need overtime costs and so on to capture this but here we kind of have a regular staff a uh, smaller number here you'd have to have six persons you can uh, cope with three you would have three four here and zero here and making this work is also very difficult okay it's, it's very hard to hire people on those conditions so it's always nice to have a kind of steady demand and obviously you can use price to steady demand given that you are in the monopoly if you're not you can't okay so this is what dynamic pricing in logistics is about trying to kind of adapt a pricing scheme into a situation which makes your production or if you like logistics costs smaller so you kind of see logistics in combini combi combination with pricing could you think about uh, now we know that we see these in air transport but we don't see it in other transport, do we? We don't see it on trains, at least I haven't seen it. We don't see it on buses. Do we see it on taxis? I don't know, maybe in some countries. Do we see this on milk? No. Do we see it on other products? Maybe on trains. Maybe on trains? 
and the spare, they do offer some low price tickets sometimes. But that's a kind of, the, the, yeah maybe, so you think it's related to the fact that they have a small, a small amount of customers then? I mean, they do have more commercials during the summer. Yeah, but the, 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 the key is here that it, it kind of must be related to kind of uh, the demand side. Uh, logically, I, 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 I would expect you to be right, but I'm not so sure that they actually do it. But, uh, but what about manufactured goods? Do we see this on cars? Do we see this on... Uh, of course, if, if I'm a producer of seasonal products like uh, which sell out in Christmas, do we see cheap Christmas trees in October? Do we? In, in July? No, we don't see that, do we? No. So we don't see it so much. And the reason is kind of obvious, because most customers find these very unfair, don't they? Th this is something which we have to think about. For one reason or the other, airplane tickets doesn't seem... They seem to have been able to do this. Of course, they are an effective monopoly, that's very important. Given that you have decided on, on a certain, certain airplane, then of course you can do this because then people cannot escape, at least they don't want to do that. So you need to, you need to have a kind of an effect effective monopoly and you need to kind of cope with this fairness problem because most customers, they don't want to go to the shop one day and buy a new sofa to 13,000 kronos and then hear that the neighbor the day after just paid 2,000 kronos for it. Okay, Then you get angry, don't you? The other way around you don't, but, uh, mm -hmm. but that's... Uh, but, but you obviously see the potential here, okay? There is a potential here to earn more money. And in the air, air traffic business, you, you, you kind of call this, it have a special name then, it's called revenue management, RM. Uh, later they, they tend to use the term demand-based management. Now let's return to our example from uh, Molde Football Club. We, then we kind of discussed um, these different matches and we kind of agreed, at least to some extent, that previously, at least historically, there is a certain match which was very popular, which was the g match against Rosenborg. Now if you are to apply these techniques, how would you do it if you were Molde Football Club? What would you do then? You would increase the prices on the Rosenborg match and lower it on the other ones, okay? Maybe you don't have to, but at least you would increase it there, because then you know the demand is, is there, okay? Do they do that? No, okay? When we pre-sell tickets, then we have the option of doing this, don't we? We can kind of have Certain prices very early, other prices very late. Do we see this? No, I think that's a candidate where it could be tested, okay? Uh, whether it works, I don't know. Uh, again, you are in a kind of monopolist, monopoly situation. The World Cup final in football is a monop an effective monopoly. And of course you could start pre-selling tickets to kind of capture the demand. And when the demand increases, you just increase the prices to, to get more revenue, as the, the term indicates, revenue management. Now, if we look a little bit formally into this, uh, maybe we should do it like this instead. I think it's easier to, to see now. Okay. Now, in order to do this formally, then we kind of, at, at least as a simple start, we need to have information about demand, okay? And we need to have time divided information about demand. Okay, so we need to have some demand curves here, which kind of differs in different points in time. Here we'll have one the marker, here we have another one, a third one, and so on. So we need a set of demand curves. If we just make it simple, we can say that they are, they are linear ones. So this is the demand curve then. If you multiply it by price, we get the revenue. Okay, and this, there's a time subscript here to indicate that uh, these demand curves uh, indeed are different from one time period to another. 
And then we can kind of change our lot size problem as we discussed previously. Now we're kind of back into the lot size world to kind of indicate for you how we can kind of analyze this. Instead of minimizing cost now, we could instance, instead maximize profits where this RT is the revenue and then we subtract the normal cost structure. Of course, we have to have this, this uh, inventory balance constraint and we perhaps need to, to handle these binary variables. Not perhaps, we actually need to do that. And then there is some possible links on how these demand curves could and should be. Okay, it's something to do with whether it's negative demand or whatever. We need to take care of that. But the point is here that we can actually analyze this problem now to kind of try to find another variable in the problem, the price variable. So we know we do not only find so much to produce and then to produce, but also different prices in different time periods. So we kind of change logistics focus in a sense when we go in this direction. We kind of move from a kind of traditional cost minimizing way of thinking into a more profit related way. And at the same time, we kind of break to some extent the basic definition of lo logistics, which kind of normally deals with problems where prices, design and marketing and stuff are kind of made. And then you get the demand profile, which you can, you, you, your aim is to satisfy. So here we kind of mix non-logistics and logistics uh, decisions in one problem. Of course, this is a very simplified type of problem. This is a kind of a, a profit maximizing lot sizing problem, if you like, or a, 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 a lot sizing problem where price is a variable in addition to the traditional variables. Uh, so, so this is just an example on how you can kind of formalize this type of problem if you are interested in solving it. The, the, the problem is that when you move from the original cost minimizing situation into a situation where you include revenues, uh, you have to have a monopoly. If you don't have a monopoly, then this is crazy, isn't it? Because then your customers will run to your competitor instead when you have the high prices and they will run to you when you have the low, low prices. So in reality, you won't see this demand anymore, okay? This demand in a competitive situation is kind of linked to a certain equilibrium. And then you start changing the prices, you also might change the equilibrium, and in that case, it doesn't work. The other problem is the fairness aspect. Of course, if you really have a monopoly, then the customers or even the authorities may say, this is very unfair, we don't like this. Now you're really exploiting mon monopoly power, this should not be allowed. Okay? So you may, need, you may meet a kind of Legis uh, law type of problem as well as a kind of real consumer problem. So these kind of experiments must be performed with care. But I have a feeling that in the future we might see more of this in the event side. Because it, it's, it's kind of obvious, it, it kind of resembles the airplanes a lot. Uh, you, you kind of buy a certain time before and you, you can kind of have this, this prices available on the internet and you can order your tickets. You already have the system. Don't you? you have this ticket master in Norway where you can kind of buy tickets. Of course you expand these kind of web pages, you can have a price history and telling you when it's cheap and, and not. Of course that could stabilize. In that case of course the point of stabilizing demand related to this would not be so high. Because uh, of course you could probably deal with less amount of ticket sales stuff, but this is mainly automat automatic these days, so, so this argument is perhaps not that relevant. But uh, an argument related to increasing your profit could be interesting. Remember we talked about pre-sales and the World Championship in football final, okay? And we said, okay, why do they pre-sell tickets to, th to that? And we, we kind of argued that it had to be related to some fairness aspect, okay? That somebody must be allowed to buy a ticket to the World Champion Final, even if they are poor and are living there and so on, okay? But still you could have changing prices on that matter as well. No problem with that. Uh, as long as you kind of at some point have cheap prices, then of course you can have higher prices at other points. The nice thing about introducing dynamic pr pricing in those cases would be that it would be much tougher to, to, to do black marketing, okay? Because if you have a kind of 
dynamic profile here, which kind of captures the, the real demand, then it's much more tricky for those who make money on the black market, isn't it? Because they, they have to kind of outsmart the market itself, which is much tougher. So it, it kind of serves at least that dimension, even though it may be uh, judged as unfair, it, uh, it opens up for, the, for these possibilities. Now this model, as you see here, is a deterministic model. There is no uncertainty here, but of course the airplane market and all other kinds of markets also have uncertainty here, or in the sense that you, can, you cannot if you're able to, to estimate these curves, the demand curves, so there is probably some uncertainty related to them as well. And of course uh, that must also be handled, so this is just kind of a starting point to, for a type of model which must be extended, also including uncertainty, I, I, I presume. The nice thing about this type of model is that it turns out to be much easier to solve than the cost minimization version. And the reason is kind of obvious, because these types of models, especially if you have a, a multi-product version of this one, you remember we kind of added uh, a an, an subscript for the product here, so you could, and then you had to add this uh, capacity constraint, is that they're, they're very hard to solve. And the reason is in the sense that your only option in the model is to kind of move production. Okay, Either I produce it now or I produce it later, and then you, you kind of shift production around, and it, it's, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's the cost changes are re relatively small, and then you, you cannot design an algorithm that kind of efficiently finds the optimal solution. When you introduce prices, then you have another option, don't you? Then you can use the price. So if, if you kind of find a solution which is close to feasible, meaning that we almost are where we have a solution we can use, then you can use the price to, to make it feasible, because you can increase the price to take, take off the demand uh, to make the capacity constraint fit. So you kind of open up flexibility in models when you introduce pricing. And that is another aspect here, okay? These models, or they may be hard to solve, so uh, maybe it's interesting to, to look at it in that perspective. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Next week we finish up on the last chapters. No, there is only three left, I think. This was number seven, then there's eight, nine, and ten. We will use a little time on chapter 8 uh, and chapter 9. Chapter 10 is just a page, I think, so that's just... Uh, then I was really lazy. So, uh, any questions? This instrument of dynamic pricing in general, I think we will see more of. Uh, maybe especially in events, I'm not sure. That depends, okay? But there is an option which is kind of not taken out yet. And in the long run, all options will be taken out to maximize profits for profit seekers. So uh, in that sense, you, you should expect this to, to evolve more. There has been some discussion on using these more on manufactured products. But again, it's this monopoly assumption which is evident. The nice thing about events is that you more or less have a monopoly in that sense. So it's easier for a event producer to utilize these means than other producers. And that is an important point. Okay. Questions? No questions. Okay. Then we stop the tape.